to DAISY 2020. For our next session, we're going to have PDSS session. For our chair, let me introduce you Dr. Lin Xuanren from Taiwan and commentators, Dr. Christopher Liu from Singapore and Dr. Lu Mingxi from China. Hello, uh, everyone. Welcome to participate the following section. Uh, I will uh, call uh, chair with uh, Professor Lin and uh, two other commander, uh, Professor Liu and uh, Professor Liu. Uh, hello. Professor Lin, okay, and uh, hello, uh, Professor Liu in Singapore, and uh, Professor uh, Liu uh, at China. Okay, um, the first topic will present by uh, Professor Lin at Taiwan uh, online, please. For our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Lin Xuanren from Taiwan, sharing about percutaneous PD catheters placement by nephro. Logist. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have here us? Welcome to the Peritoneum Access Symposium 2020. I'm the Dr. Lin Xuanren. I come from Asia University. And, uh, Recently, there are increasing interest in interventional nephrologists. Wait a moment. Oh. And my topic is percutaneous peritoneal dialysis catheter placement by nephrologist. Begin of, before the beginning, we all begin with a patient. 67 years old woman with hypertension DM more than 10 years, present with poor appetite more than 10 days. Her creatinine was more than 10 milligram deciliter. Maybe she needs dialysis. And I talk about peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. After discussion, initially, she favored peritoneal dialysis. But after I consulting and the physiologist, she turned back for the peritoneal dialysis because she was informed many risky, many, many risk with an shot aberration and the CV outcome. So she chose hemodialysis eventually. It's about a patient, but she, she, would, she was a patient with CKD, but she, favor peritoneal dialysis initially. If she choose the hemodialysis eventually because the very high risk. So we take a look at HDSS and the peritoneal access. If I am a patient with DKD, if I want to choose the hemodialysis, I can take the hemodialysis access before the hemodialysis and it could be done in outpatient department under local anesthesia. But if I want peritoneal dialysis access, I was always reserve the operation after hemodialysis and in admission under general anesthesia. If I am a patient with DKD, PD dialysis may be, have many, many difficulties for us to achieve. Fortunately, we found a way to solve the problem. In my opinion, ideal peritoneal dialysis may have following components. At the beginning, high successful rate and it's available in everywhere, like admission outpatient or critical care unit. And it must be have low complications and it could Finally, relieve the patient unit, patient's symptoms, and maybe need no need for temporary assets, and it could augment PD penetrations. We achieve the we achieve the the first performance in 2017 March, until last October, 193 patients 
reserve the operation with the failed 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 for placement at the 90 97 97 percentage successful rate is high success rate and we could do late list procedure everywhere about half half in admission half in outpatient and seven patients in intensive critical unit we can do less in critical care patients uh, those patients was critical care maybe hypotension shock status metabolic acidosis and we have low hack low complications no bowel, bowel, bowel preparation no exercise infection or peritonitis within first two weeks no hematoma no obstruction this one this procedure has no complications. And we could timely relieve the patient's symptoms. 163 reserve 163 patients reserve the operation. And we have extremely short breaking period. Our breaking period is definite from the defined with uh, time from insertion to installation of more than one liter dialysis. Our average breaking period was one, it was 0 0.72 day, and half patient was installation of more than one liter in first day. And uh, most of them have no need for temporary Essex. About 70, 78 patients, those patients was from pre sd to peritoneal per dialysis they don't need temporary access or a temporary hemodialysis. The PD was the, the ultimate dialysis modality. And the list, list procedure augment our PD penetration for the patient from period SRD to SRD, about 89% enter peritoneal dialysis. Then, then look for look back to the ideal peritoneal dialysis. What do we do? High successful rate was about ninety seven percentage, and we is we can down everywhere. No matter and we have no low complications, especially no bowel preparations, and we can timely relieve the patient uremic symptoms and only 0 0.2, 0 0.72 day to bring breaking period is timely relieve the patient symptoms and the 78 patient have no need for temporary access and the PD penetration rate was 89% and then we see the video a bread brief, brief video for the procedure.
Okay. Uh, this is our videos about the, the procedures and we initially lo localized the, the insertion site, put the procedures through the guide and uh, put the peer wishes to open it. Uh, and the last, we test the examination. Uh, the, the procedure will take about 10 minutes to 20 minutes um, on long or short, but we average the operation duration was 12 minutes. And we can perform in the outpatient or inpatient or intensive critical care unit. And we almost do this uh, routinely and seldom transfer the patient to the operation unit. Oh, it's our teams, it's our director and the, the peritoneal and hemodialysis unit teams. And we welcome to invite you, and we we would like to invite everyone to out to part, take part in the uh, the procedures in vendors. And uh, the next speech was Doctor famous Doctor Stu's, and we look forward for the wonderful speech. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Lin. It's a very excellent presentation. Uh, because the time we are so fixed on the uh, on time, so I will uh, present the second uh, topic, and the discussion will be uh, performed after she talk or finish. For our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Huang Tan Long from Taiwan, sharing about prevent po post-operative complications after laparoscopic. KCAPD catheters implantation. Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure uh, to present this topic. I appreciate uh, the invitation of President Cole and uh, the organizing committee. And I, I will um, focus on the history of the surgical uh, catheter, PD catheter implantation and uh, how to improve and uh, to resolve uh, every uh, possible complication. Uh, as we know, uh, the catheter of PD uh, developed in the early 1927, but start in the beginning with the metallic trocar. And then it's a glass cannula, and the third time it's uh, developed is the foley catheter. And, uh, 1964 uh, is uh, developed by uh, Gordon and Palmer. It's a silicon rubber catheter. But the, on the import, most important time is the uh, Harry Tenkohoff. Uh, he developed the Tenkohoff catheter uh, at 1968. Uh, those are several uh, catheter was modified. Uh, such as uh, Tawala Wasaki, uh, but uh, uh, many customers uh, is uh, up than the then, but uh, the ten of customers uh, is widely used uh, in most uh, uh, country and even in Taiwan. So uh, we start the, uh, the HAPD implant uh, in about uh, 20, uh, eight uh, years ago, and now uh, we almost uh, have the annual 60 to 70 uh, or 80 uh, patients per year. And then my total experience is 2,002 uh, between patients in the past 28 years. And so far the current uh, GAPT program uh, was used at around uh, uh, 400 cases at the Lincoln Tanker Memorial Hospital. And we modified the classic surgical implantation from um, low mid nine and paramedia nine. And uh, now uh, in the early time, is, uh, uh, we uh, use a very small and uh, low uh, paramedia incision implantation. And I also uh, published the modified method to prevent uh, uh, the catheter migration uh, because most uh, 
uh, and only the cassette is the uh, cassette implantation uh, by meteorologist or some uh, classical surgeon. The most uh, complication is the migration. So I modify to add another fixation, uh, so uh, to reduce uh, uh, the um, migration rate uh, or even uh, uh, other complication. So it's uh, the paper published in 1995. And there are still some methods uh, I will mention, uh, such as uh, SMAP uh, procedure. It's uh, proposed by Professor Monkhoff and uh, Popovic uh, in 2007. But uh, uh, after 2000, uh, year 2000, uh, the deposit implantation uh, is widely uh, used uh, after uh, 27th century. So uh, the new method uh, is, was uh, replaced by the lap laparoscopic uh, PD implant, catheter implantation. So uh, we should consider the uh, most uh, perfect uh, uh, criteria. We should, uh, first, uh, we should choose the uh, idea CAPD catheter. The second is to use the best method uh, for PD implantation. The third is the rapid resolve uh, PD complication. And the last is we should keep a very uh, well organized teamwork to let uh, the CAPD program uh, achieve the uh, very perfect. So um, my talk uh, including four uh, Fear. Uh, the first is uh, the shortly uh, introduced the uh, laparoscopic catheter implantation. Uh, laparoscopic is uh, always a uh, uh, proportive technique which are not conventionally used uh, before uh, year 2000. But uh, he enabled a clear laparoscopic visualization and, uh, of any adhesion or hernia in the pineal cavity. So uh, in 2003, uh, the first uh, uh, publication is by Ogi, Onagi. Uh, it uh, uses uh, laparoscopic implantation. Uh, those is the case uh, in that paper is not so many, but uh, anyway, uh, it's uh, reports uh, quite an idea uh, procedure to achieve a very uh, high susceptible maintain rate and uh, many few acceptable complications. Um, we started the Nebraska uh, CAPD catheter implantation uh, since 2007, and uh, we uh, use uh, very, uh, only two small incisions, uh, but under uh, general anesthesia, uh, we can uh, to keep uh, uh, use a very safe uh, position and uh, to prevent any with uh, organ injury and use a uh, non adhesive uh, suture technique uh, to suture fix the catheter in the very low uh, lateral position of the low paternal cavity. And that's a, a very small incision uh, from the intra umbilical incision and uh, that move out the catheter uh, from another uh, working uh, portal. And that's uh, uh, to finish the procedure, and the patient uh, can uh, get a very ideal uh, position and uh, no uh, any pos possibility of uh, consider migration. So that the uh, uh, patient can start the uh, dialysis uh, program uh, in a few days and steadily uh, to improve uh, until the full uh, capacity. Mm, let's uh, compare uh, the two class between classical method and laparoscopic uh, uh, procedure. So laparoscopic is uh, less pain and uh, less uh, migration and uh, very few uh, leakage, but uh, it's uh, uh, need uh, under uh, general anesthesia. So the complication of classical implantation, implantation uh, is usually, as uh, we know, uh, the bleeding, dialysis leakage, and uh, out in outflow 
occlusion or hernia. And the infection rate uh, is still um, cannot uh, um, be worn. Um, the complication rate is usually very low and uh, usually is uh, acceptable uh, even uh, in the classical, um, classical method. But uh, our publication in 2013, that uh, uh, the laparoscopic uh, procedure, uh, those are the patient uh, we published at that time is only 40 eight patients uh, compared to the classical, uh, the demographic data is uh, similar, but uh, the complication migration uh, rate is very skewing lower than classical time and uh, the per meso and also the some uh, considered leakage is uh, very acceptable and uh, very few uh, considered failure. So that's the survival consider curve is uh, uh, better than uh, classical method. Uh, how to prevent uh, laparoscopic um, consider implantation? Uh, it's uh, my uh, major purpose uh, to report this uh, paper, uh, this talk. That's, uh, as I show, uh, the consider uh, occlusion mostly is due to the augmented wrapping. Uh, for some patient, it's uh, very uh, obese, uh, in the, um, huge amount of the uh, great momentum, and it's easy to cause the uh, occlusion with the wrapping the catheter. And some is a uh, uh, method we should uh, consider that uh, how to prevent uh, greater momentum to wrap. That uh, during the uh, implantation, uh, we start to uh, fix the, the greater momentum uh, with the fine uh, clipper uh, four to five to fix on the ground uh, ligament, ground ligament uh, of the upper abdomen. So that's uh, uh, the fixation of the clip. It's uh, easy can be done by most uh, uh, young uh, surgeon can do that. So that's uh, uh, the all the four, uh, five catheter complete. And that's our, the table to compare two group as the first group is on pexy and the second column is a non on pexy so that the demography is usually similar no difference and uh, that's uh, we can see uh sorry and uh, the difference that's uh, augmented wrapping, very few, uh, almost uh, zero uh, the augmented wrapping in, with the augmented flexi group. And those are the uh, difference is not so different, but uh, uh, you need a more uh, case to achieve the complete uh, uh, difference. And the second, we should consider how to early detect the hernia. Uh, the laparoscope uh, implantation have the advantage to find out uh, any uh, existing um, hernia internal with a uh, visible hernia sac during uh, implantation um, surgery. So that's uh, uh, the arrow is show that's the um, hernia uh, defect. Those uh, uh, can be with the mesh, the laparoscope use, but uh, the mesh causing uh, some direct free can uh, push into the suck. So we still use uh, uh, the materials uh, uh, hernia roughly after implantation in the same procedure. Uh, that's uh, uh, finish the uh, uh, implantation, then uh, do the uh, one side or two side uh, hernia roughly. So that's uh, uh, also, we compare that two group. Uh, those is cost uh, some uh, longer time uh, compared to uh, no uh, hernia wrap with some materials, see? But uh, that uh, we can show the, uh, the hernia repair uh, we did, and the uh, patient can prevent, uh, totally uh, prevent uh, the hydroscotum uh, one side or two side uh, after uh, laparoscopic implantation catheter or other method. 
and it's an early detector and uh, some materials uh, herniography and that's uh, the, our accumulated survival rate and it's compared uh, to the non hernia repair. So that's a very uh, idea uh, concept to cemetery uh, to repair the uh, internal uh, hernia sac hernia uh, during uh, the same time operation. So that's uh, uh, we can uh, achieve uh, the very uh, idea and uh, no complication uh, after consider implantation. So successful surgeon should consider you should the best uh, consider uh, for CAPD and a better method uh, for PD implantation and let PD resolve the complication or prevent it. And the last, uh, you should uh, keep a very good teamwork. So our, uh, we are lucky in such a, a big hospital. We uh, found uh, this uh, team uh, for uh, almost uh, 28 years and um, all the uh, nurses and uh, attending uh, physician uh, including we cooperate with the nephrologist uh, and uh, we can resolve the every um, complication um, very quickly and that's uh, we keep our uh, CAPD consider uh, keep the survival rate almost uh, around uh, 40 uh, to 50 and uh, some um, in recent years we can get uh, is very over the uh, 55 percent uh, so uh, my conclusion uh, is Laplace Cassida implantation technique is a very good choice uh, for uh, PD uh, Cassida implantation. And those are uh, some uh, bedside implantation or uh, non-surgical uh, implantation uh, is, uh, has some advantage as the Dr. Lin uh, told in the previous talk but we will discuss later. And the second is uh, omentopexy during uh, uh, carcinoma implantation can prevent omentopexy uh, rapid and uh, longer carcinoma survival. And the last uh, uh, point is the uh, cemented hernia sac ligation and hernia roughly can avoid the later hydro uh, sportum, uh, one side or both sides. So that's a uh, uh, very attainable uh, appreciate your uh, attention uh, is uh, my talk. Thank you. For our next speaker, let's welcome. Yeah, we, we uh, proceed to the third talk. And then after three talks, uh, we were uh, for open for discussion by the commander. Thank you. For our third speaker, let's welcome Dr. Loman Wei from Hong Kong, talking about treatment of PD infection and complications. Good morning, everyone. I hope you stay strong and healthy when you are watching this video. Uh, it's a shame that I cannot attend the conference in person because of the Wuhan pneumonia outbreak. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to do this talk today. I'm Dr. Lo from Hong Kong and I'm a nephrologist. The title of this talk is Treatment of PD Infection and Complications. It's a very broad topic and it's not possible for me to cover every details in 15 minutes time. So the talk today is not meant to be comprehensive and I will just give the principles and directions for treatment of such infection. And I hope you enjoy the video. First, I will talk about the peritonitis followed by exercise infection and tunnel infection. Before I talk about the treatment of peritonitis, I would like to spend some time on making the diagnosis of uh, peritonitis. The following are the features of uh, CPD peritonitis. The first one is the clinical feature of peritonitis, and this includes abdominal pain or cloudy dialysate. 
The second feature is the Dallasay Ephraim under the microscope and it will show the white cell count more than 100 per microliter with more than 50% polymorphonuclear cells. The first feature is the positive Dallasay Ephraim culture. So if a patient satisfies at least two of the above features, a diagnosis of CPD peritonitis is made. We do not wait the culture results available before giving antibiotics because it takes several days. And we'll give empirical antibiotics after the microbiological specimen have been obtained. Antibiotics regime should be center specific and cover both the gram positive and gram negative organism. Gram positive organisms should be covered by vancomycin or first generation cathosporin. Whether or not to give vancomycin depends on the local prevalence of methicillin resistant staph aureus, MRSA. If the prevalence of MRSA is high, vancomycin will be preferred over first generation cathosporin. For gram-negative organism, they should be covered with third-generation cathosporin or immunoglycoside. However, we have to bear in mind that extensive use of immunoglycoside may cause emergence of resistant microorganisms. So the local center should monitor the resistant pattern regularly and adjust the empirical antibiotics accordingly. An alternate regimen is cefepin monotherapy as it can cover both the gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. Intraperitoneal antibiotic is the preferred route of administration unless the patient has features of systemic sepsis because it can result in a high intraperitoneal drug level. IP administration avoids venipuncture and allows home therapy. It can be given in each exchange, known as the continuous treatment, or once daily, known as the intermittent treatment. After we started the empirical antibiotics, we have to monitor the patient's ultrafiltration. This is because reduction in ultrafiltration is commonly observed in patients with peritonitis due to the increase in membrane permeability during the peritonitis. In such case, temporary use of higher tonicity of PD fluid or icodestrin may be needed. And once the cultural results and sensitivities are available, the antibiotic therapy should be modified to a narrow spectrum agents. The PD fluid should be inspected visually for clearance and if no improvement after 48 hours, repeated culture should be performed. Concerning the duration of antibiotics, most CAPD peritonitis require three weeks antibiotics except streptococcus and coagulase negative staph staphylococcus require two weeks antibiotics only. And Pseudomonas and Stranotrophomonas require three to four weeks antibiotics. In most cases, single antibiotics is adequate, except for spice organisms, which require two antibiotics. So the spice organisms refer to Seracea, Pseudomonas, Indopositive organisms, including Plotius, or Providentia, Citrobacter, and Enterobacter. The use of two antibiotics is to reduce the risk of relapse and recurrence. There are several types of peritonitis. Refractory peritonitis refers to failure of the Ephraim to clear after five days of appropriate antibiotics. Recurrent peritonitis refers to an episode occurs within four weeks of completion of 
therapy of a viral episode, but with a different organism. Relapse peritonitis refers to an episode occur within four weeks of completion of therapy of a viral episode, but designed with the same organism. Repeat peritonitis refers to an episode occur more than four weeks of a viral episode, but with the same organisms. In these conditions, removal of the tank of catheter are indicated. If multiple enteric organisms are grown from PD efferent, surgical evaluation should be obtained immediately when there is no prompt clinical response. CT scan should be done to identify the underlying intra-abdominal pathology. For antibiotics, we should give IP metronidazone to cover the anaerobe, plus the vancomycin to cover gram-positive microorganisms, and cathotasamine or aminoglycoside to cover gram-negative microorganisms. For fungal peritonitis, the standard treatment is intravenous amphotericin B and orofocytosin. Intraperitoneal amphotericin B can be used, but they may cause chemical peritonitis and pain. Other antifungals that may be useful for treatment of such condition include fluconazole for candida, echinocadine for aspergillus, for sarconazole or variconazole for filamentous fungi. ISPD guidelines recommend immediate catheter removal. However, our center is adopting a deferred catheter replacement approach. The antifungals were given as usual, but the replacement of catheter is performed when the PD even clear up. In our case series, 9 out of 11 patients return to PD after a total of 31 days of antifungal chemotherapy. In case of refractory or relapsing peritonitis with negative bacterial culture, we have to bear in mind the possibility of uh, tuberculous peritonitis. In these cases, the PD microscopy will show lymphocytosis, DNA PCR or peritoneal biopsy can be performed for more rapid diagnosis. For treatment, it involves four anti-TB drugs, rafampicin, isoniazine, paracinamide, and ofoxacin. In general, paracinamide and ofoxacin can be stopped after two months, while rafampicin and isoniazine continue for 12 to 18 months. Non-tuberculous mycobacterial peritonitis is a rare condition, but they may mimic gram-positive diphtheriae. Some of the examples are Mycobacterium fortuitum, Mycobacterium chelonii, and Mycobacterium abscesses. Treatment regimen is not well established and involves combination of antibiotics such as cefosetin, and micacin, meropenem, carifomycin, and doxycycline for mumps. Catheter removal is usually necessary. The optimal duration between catheter removal and reinsertion of new catheter is not known. Some observational studies suggest a minimum period of two to three weeks. But after peritonitis, the reinsertion should be done under laparoscopic or peritoneoscopic guidance where direct visualization for adhesion can be done. And then I will proceed to exercise infection and tunnel tract infection. Exercise infection is defined or diagnosed as the presence of purulent discharge with or without erythema of the skin at the catheter epidermal interface. Tunnel infection is defined or diagnosed as the presence of clinical inflammation or ultrasonographic evidence of collection along the catheter tunnel. To prevent exercise infections, prophylactic antibiotics should be administered immediately before catheter insertion. 
However, no technique of catheter placement and no particular catheter design have been demonstrated to be superior to another for the prevention of catheter-related infection. There is an exercise scoring system which may help in the diagnosis or monitoring of the exercise infection. In this scoring system, there are several clinical features such as the swelling, crust, redness, pain, and drainage. Depends on the severity, they will score different points. If the patient score four points or above, infection of the exercise is likely. However, we have to bear in mind that this scoring system is developed by the pediatricians and is not validated in adult patients. The empirical antibiotics of choice for exercise infection would be cloxacillin or first generation cephalosporin. However, if the patient had a prior history of infection or colonization with MRSA or pseudomonas species, vancomycin or appropriate anti pseudomonal antibiotics should be given instead. Most exercise infection require two weeks course of antibiotics, except for pseudomonas infection, where the course of antibiotics has to extend to three weeks. For tunnel tract infection, ultrasound examination can be performed to look for response to treatment, and a sonolution area of 1 mm thick around the external cuff or involvement of the internal cuff are associated with a poor outcome. There are several indications for catheter removal. They are, first, refractory exercise infection or tunnel tract infection fail to respond to effective antibiotics after three weeks, or if the exercise infection progresses to or occurs simultaneously with peritonitis. Most of the information in this talk were taken from International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, the ISPD guidelines. This end my presentations. Thank you. Okay, uh, please uh, let uh, Lin, uh, Lin, to continue the discussion. Thank you for three uh, wonderful and excellent speeches. And uh, uh, do anyone have questions for three speakers? Uh, hi, it's Christopher from Singapore. Uh, thanks for the excellent talks and uh, for inviting me to be the commentator. I have a question for you, uh, Jenin. Uh, you, we, we do insert PD catheters ourselves in, uh, in uh, my institution. So we do it uh, with fluoroscopy. Uh, similarly, percutaneous, but with fluoroscopy to see where the wire coils up. So I, I know that your center doesn't do that uh, and do it effectively blind. How do you, what do you all do to ensure that your, your wire or your catheter is in the right place, and, uh, not in the bowel? Oh, good and uh, questions. Uh, initially, we, we do the placement uh, under the real-time ultrasonography. And the uh, ultrasonography, you can see the three layers of peritoneums. And when we do this uh, for the and, and fine needles to through the uh, per, uh, parental peritoneums and we push the uh, normal selling or push the air to the peritoneums. When we do needle through the parental peritoneums and you feel the uh, relief, and you, when you relief, you can test the uh, normal selling under the ultrasonography, you can do the bout or others can extend. In when extend, you sure you, you can make sure the needle through the peritoneum, peritoneum. And you when you push the guide wire into the into the peritoneum cavity, and when you do do that, you can feel some bow or or parental or momentum to stop it. So we ad adjust the procedures. We push, when we uh, push the pair wet shoes and the tank of shoes, we use the stylet, stylet to extend the 
tip of the PD catheter to the cutie stack or the post uh, bladder area. When you push it, the patient, our patient is cleared and only under the local anesthesia. So it could explain or it can complain for to, to voiding or to the uh, uh, defecate. So when she or he complained of this, you can uh, feel the, the, the tip may be the right weight. Uh, besides, when we push the, the guy wine and push the tank off, we can test test the inflow and or outflow flow flow rate. When flow rate is free and is smooth, you can make sure the functional the catheter, and then you use the ultrasonography to tackle the terminal and the tech tackle the exercise to sh make sure your your catheter it was you you ships or under uh, under the subcutaneous layer and in this way we can make sure the tip or the catheter in right way thank you okay uh, any other uh Question uh, from the recommender or the any well, I please okay. Yeah, okay. John Swinnan, um, Joseph, I enjoyed your talk. In with respect to placing the catheter safely, a number of Australian hospitals have recently introduced the Seldinger technique to place peritoneal dialysis catheters including our own and I've been responsible for doing that at our hospital and as um, Christopher pointed out I think uh, fluoroscopy is very important for safety the biggest disaster that can befall PD catheter placement is causing peritonitis in these very vulnerable patients not only does it mean the PD fails but the patient now has a perforated bowel and they're immunosuppressed so it's a total disaster so the steps we are taking in our program to prevent um, incorrect catheter placement is, as the previous speaker said, we use ultrasound guided puncture so we can actually see our needle entering the peritoneal cavity. We then do contrast peritoneography through that needle. So we inject dye into the peritoneal cavity, which will confirm that we're in the right place. We then put a micro sheath into the peritoneal cavity and do a further contrast peritoneography to confirm we're in the right place. And then we thread our wire in under X-ray guidance to see that it ends up in the um, uh, pouch of Douglas as intended. So we've got three safeguards to protecting the bowel. First of all, ultrasound. Secondly, contrast peritoneography. And thirdly, uh, fluoroscopic guide of our wire. Um, hopefully, using all three methods, we will prevent any bowel perforation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Jen. Uh, any uh, other? Okay. Yeah. The, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Lu Min Xi okay. from the yep. Sir Wang Xiao Hospital, uh, uh, China. I'm a nephrologist. Uh, just I performed the, the percutaneous PD catheter implantation, also the laparoscopy implantation. Uh, I have some experience to share. Uh, and first, uh, I just agree with the Dr. Swin. Just uh, I just uh, do the puncture uh, PD catheter implantation. I just uh, uh, guided the real time in the ultrasound. It kind of avoided the, the bowel uh, preparation also. Uh, can avoid the injury of the epigastric and arteries. Uh, also, when I when I um, just puncture into the uh, peritoneal cavity, I just feel uh, one liter of normal ceiling, and then you you use ultrasound to guide the caster because if we have normal ceilings, it can uh, have contrast with the uh, um, organs. So we can find the, the uh, in ultrasound, we can find the tip of the catheter. So can put the catheter tip into the right position. It's the, my experience. 
uh, another uh, to the laparoscopic implant implantation uh, are always do the extra peritoneal tunneling so the inlet of the ca uh, peritoneal cavity of the caster will rise lower so it can reduce the risk uh, of the um, caster tip uh, migration so it's my experience uh, also i have, have another question for the <laughs> dr uh, ling shenren so okay. uh, it's uh, just uh, um i want to share if you, if you uh, that's the whether you put the inner cuff into the uh, anterior rectus schist when you put in the caster okay oh, thank you for good questions it's all uh, we are always uh, ask for the, uh, the question like this and uh, in our in our procedures we cannot show uh, omentum wrapping or hydrothorax or hydroscorton like the second speakers. So we would push, we, we make the procedure like a nephrologist and in nephrologist opinion, we begin the peritoneal dialysis as soon as possible to relieve the patient and relieve the duration between the insertion and the, uh, adequate dialysis. And we make the, the procedure to to through to through the peritoneum, and uh, when we uh, peer with uh, a pull a weight, uh, our need, need and our guide wise in the peritoneum cavity, and push the tank of catheter through the guide wide, and with uh, we uh, we use the um, <coughs> mask or the needle holder to through uh, put a uh, kick the the inner cut through the subcutaneous we can take the this operation uh, take we can suture the, the inner cut in the omen uh, in the rectal muscle we only push push into in the subcutaneous layer and uh, and uh, and we use the trocar to make turn later and so when we use use the the terminal, we use the very 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 huge to make sure tip in the QD sac and to make sure the U wave to keep the the catheter to migration. The migration rate uh, until now we didn't take the, the result very 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 clearly, but we migration rate uh, was related to uh, one and two percentage. Uh, within one hour, uh, within one one year, so we our migration rate may be uh, similar to the uh, operation, the uh, tradition operations. So when we do the U U shape U shape turn nodes and the very very U U shape turn nodes, the tip the tip or the the catheter may achieve uh, uh, approve the the blood. But uh, some one uh, I meet some uh, one person when we do this so do this uh, the, the tip was uh, my uh, migration within uh, half, half years six months and we 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 consult the uh, operator surgery when when he to see the microscopic the, the migration catheter was omitted wrapping only after six months so uh, our our procedure can cannot totally uh, uh, prevent migration or maintain raping but when we do this so local anesthesia we can um, we can minimal invasive and you can see the minimal width and we can feel the lots of volume of dialysis and it can do it soon so our operation, uh, our our procedures was not not very very uh, perfect, but could do this. Uh, and never just could do this soon and relieve the uremic symptom very soon. Then the then a traditional operation. Okay, as uh, at the uh, time our this section is uh, up and finished, so we should uh. uh close uh, this session 
Uh, I very really appreciate uh, um, Professor Lin uh, for the chair uh, this section, and uh, to other uh, the commander, uh, Dr. Lau uh, <coughs> and uh, Dr. Li, uh, and also appreciate to uh, all of you uh, participate in this section. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, presentation and uh, participation. Thank you.